All right, so he stepped out of his blue Lamborghini and he, uh, you know, looked like a guy who was wealthy. You would assume, right? Driving this kind of car, he, and he, sure enough, his suit is tailored, his shoes are Italian, his bank account's full. This guy's rich. And you can tell by looking at him. And, and not only is he rich, but you realize as he, as he gets out and stands up, his shoulders are broad, his stomach is flat. He runs his fingers through his dark, thick hair. <laughs> this guy, not only is he rich, he's young. And then as soon as he hits his fob to lock his car, he's walking away and his phone rings. He picks it up. He knows who it is. Immediately, he starts offering I mean, instructions. He's laying out a to-do list for somebody. He's got people under his people who have people. This guy is calling the shots. He's rich. He's young, and he is powerful. He had the three Ps of success, prosperity, posterity, and power. We know him as the rich young ruler, but here's the twist. He pulls up and he's stepping out of his car out in front of our church. He's coming in to worship. He's got his Bible and his journal. My guy is all in. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. He's all in. And all of us would say, this guy is legit. And so he encounters Jesus, and we're going to look at the rich young ruler today, and I want you to turn to your Bible. It's in Luke chapter 18. We'll get there in a moment. I want to set it up a bit, place it in context always. Now, as, as I was describing him, some of you single women were like, wait, where, where is this guy? Where is, is he really here? Um, and others, some of you men were like, he's talking about me, you know? I'm like, no, I'm not talking about you. I wasn't talking about you. Um, I mean, this guy is, hey, how about this? This guy is the most American guy in the Bible, which is why if I preach this message, Travis Cook and I were talking about this earlier. If we preach this message well, preach it right, the spirit moves, this is a hard sermon to hear. You might already know enough of the story. This is a hard sermon to preach, so beware when you encounter the real Jesus, and that's our prayer today, do you want to encounter him for real? If you encounter the real Jesus, you do not walk away indifferent. Doesn't happen. You either walk away maybe offended, like a lot of people were, and he offends the mind. He offends our hearts. You walk away saddened, or you walk away surrendered. And we're praying towards the latter, right? Now, here's the thing. I want you to capture this because it's key to what we're talking about today. We say money can't buy happiness, and, and we've noted a lot of people would agree with that, but I'd like to be the one experientially to you know, prove that. That would be good. Um, we, we know money can't buy happiness. But here's the thing. We might believe that, but here's the truth about it. Money can buy happiness. Let's be honest. Money can can buy happiness, temporary happiness for a moment. Think about it. Money, ha money gives access. Money gives you access. Let's be honest, because this is in part why we pursue it. Money gives you access to a lot of things. I was at uh, Parkland Hospital board meeting a couple years ago. One of our, uh, not because I'm on the board, but one of our members was on the board and being honored for his work uh, at Parkland Hospital. And I was there and part of the meeting. And, and part of the meeting they presented um, some healthcare facts and such based on zip codes around uh, Dallas. And, and it's out online. You can look at this. I took a deep dive into it after the fact. I was given all the information. But the average lifespan in 75215, that's South Dallas, right where the men of Nehemiah, where we serve, Cornerstone, where our partners are, right there. The average lifespan is 66 years old. The average lifespan of Turtle Creek, if you know southern part of HP, 75205 is 90 years old. Not many miles away, 24-year disparity. And there's a lot of factors there. 
But one of the factors is money. It's wealth. I mean, you go outside of the United States, right? You think about that. Go to Angola, go to a place like Afghanistan. Now there's wars and all kinds of things. The average lifespan there is 45 years old. Think about that. Where you are, statistically, where you might be born or live determines how long you're going to live. And again, there's a lot of factors, but the biggest factor is money because money gives access. Think about it. Good nutrition. We got food deserts in, in South Dallas, insurance, education, Healthcare facilities, good doctors, all the things. I read this week that LeBron James, you might have heard this, he spends $1.5 million on his body, on his health. Now he makes $50 million with his body and his health. But think about this. this see, money can open doors. And not just that, it can give opportunities, it can... We can travel, we can, we can do all the things, lots of diversions from the things that really matter. And this is the dangerous thing about wealth. It can open a lot of doors, let's be honest, but it can't open one door. It can't open the door to eternal life. Everlasting life is the, is the term used, I think, the King James, which is probably better because it's qualitative and quantitative. It cannot open the door to real life, Zoe life. That's why this gets so intertwined and why it's so hard for us. But you can't walk away neutral when you think about wealth and possessions. You can't do it. See, wealth does not open the door to life. And now is the time for many of us today. You can't even imagine the kind of sense of urgency I have in my heart and life for you. I want so much for you to be set free, to be set free from all that, that wraps up in this thing, this love of money. And don't miss this. For a lot of us here, it's all relative, right? We're living in North Dallas. So a lot of us are like, well, I'm not wealthy. I mean, I know wealthy. Well, I've seen wealthy, right? I've driven down that street, you know, or whatever. I've got friends, you know, in high places, right? No, li listen, you cannot have much money at all and be obsessed with money. Obsessed with making money, obsessed with getting more money. And, and what we, we see here is that money can buy, I guess, a lot of happiness. But be clear, temporary, momentary happiness. It cannot provide joy. Joy is something altogether different. We talk about this often at Christmas time. Joy is not based like happiness based on, on circumstance. It's not happenstance. Joy is based on pursuing the thing that really matters. That's what joy is. It's finding yourself in the flow of God's purpose in the world and pursuing him with your life. This is what we'll hear today. Following Jesus. You might know enough about this story. Following Jesus with all your heart is what brings joy into your life. This day is a great day to be here. Because Jesus is after something deeper, better than happiness. He's after real joy. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. Joy is what God is after, and joy is what you need. This is the insidious thing. We think we want happiness for a minute or for a season. What we need is joy. And so we're going to talk about unexpected joy. It's unexpected because you find it in a way you don't anticipate. Last week, you heard a sermon. If you were in here, you heard TJ talk about the healer is better than the healing. But one of the points that we made was that if your faith is based on your deliverance, then it's not faith in God. It's faith on circumstance. Right? And we so often do this. Our faith, our happiness is built on circumstances. So how are you doing today? How are, how's it going for you? Are you experiencing a true life of joy, even in the midst of your struggles and your pain? Or maybe you have enough diversions that for a moment, no, I'm pretty happy. Went on a trip this week, you know, or whatever it was. I got a raise. I'm feeling good. See, even there, see, it's a real challenging thing for us to sort through. So today we're going to do that. All right. You ready for this? Let's turn to Luke 18. 
as your heart open, 18, 18 through 30, and this will be the word of God for us. This is the famous story again of, uh, of the rich young ruler. We've already asked the first question. If you want to break it down this way, you know, what is joy? Okay, joy is not happiness. But I want to, I want to offer these three questions following that foundational um, intro there. Uh, first, what is counterfeit joy? Because that's the problem. Counterfeit joy, we could answer it quickly. Happiness, that's what it is. Counterfeit joy, what leads to false joy? What leads to this counterfeit joy? And then, then, then thirdly, how do we find true joy? That's what this story is about. Again, joy is what you're looking for, even if you didn't even name it or know it this morning. So first, what is counterfeit joy? What is this? Let's put this in context. Um, the story, you know, the, the scriptures are written in a way that are very intentional. And Luke has played it out for us, these different stories that come into the mix. And he, he offers three rejects, we would think, in the kingdom of God, or there people would think in the day. And, God, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 these are the people who actually belong. And the rejects, we saw the lepers last week, okay, those were lepers, were rejected in that culture. Um, right before this story, it's kids, sorry, children. And Jesus says, no, become like them, which would have been the most unlikely. Like, no, we got to have it all together. Got to be smart. We got to know the law. Got to follow the law. Gotta, no, no, be like children. Dependent, humble, innocent. Be like them. That's how you get in the kingdom. And then next week, he's going to talk about collect, uh, tax collectors. So you got lepers, kids, tax collectors, and this is blowing everybody's mind. And right in the middle of that is this story about a guy who is so legit, it blows everybody's minds. This guy is all in. And so what we see here is uh, in the book of Luke, this story is told in all the synoptic gospels. You know what those are? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Sin, okay, is synergy or together optic looking, looking together at the same stories. And here we find this story in all three of those gospels. And so we know more about this guy than is in the story. So when I say things like, where is that in the text? You'll know. Okay. So here it is. Verse 18, all that say, a ruler asked him, good teacher. Okay. Rabbi, Good rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, first thing out of the box there, or out of the box, is what do I need to do in order to have eternal life? He calls him ruler. So, um, I mean, this guy's likely he's a leader. Uh, he's likely a leader in the synagogue. I mean, he's a religious leader. Like he's, he's a Jewish leader. He's like a kind of a magistrate or justice of the peace, it seems. So he's, he's leader, like he's, he's big time. He comes not testing Jesus, note that. He doesn't come like others, he's not trying to trap Jesus. And the more I've studied this guy through the years, the more legit I think he is. I think he's for real. I mean, some have said, look how proud, prideful he is. Look at all, I think he's coming. Not only is he aware of scripture, he, he's longing for more, he is humble enough to recognize he doesn't have it all together. Like I'm missing something. So he comes to the right person. What must I do to receive everlasting life, like real life, okay? Look at verse 19. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That sounds like a strange response. But Jesus is saying, hey, before we get into what you need to do, there's only one who's holy. So let's go there first. Let's lay this out. God alone is good. And, but he's also, you know, could be saying as well, you're calling me good, unless I'm God, then only God is good. That's an interesting response. Only he is holy. Let's establish that before we move on, talk about how you inherit, gain eternal life. Verse 20, you know the commandments. This too is shocking. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. This seems like a random uh, you know, list of, of the commands, but it's not. When you know that this, these are the last half of the commands, you might know the first half of the command, 10 commandments have to do with our relationship with God, vertical relationship with God, you could say. The latter half have to do with our horizontal relationships with one another. Now, clearly, love God, love others is the cruciform life. Love God with all your heart. And, and serve others. I did a wedding last night and I told the couple, I said, here's, here's your charge. Here's your to-do list. Love God, 
Love each other like Jesus. Do stuff. That's it. Love God with all you've got. But Jesus doesn't go there with this guy. As if to imply, you don't have a relationship with God. You're trying to do all these things. He's focused on the horizontal, not on the vertical relationship with God. And then look at verse 21. Kind of a shocking response. This guy says, all these things I've kept uh, you know, from my youth. I've, I've done all this. And again, it seems, seems arrogant, but Jesus doesn't say, are you kidding me? Do you even understand the, the heart behind the law? Of course he doesn't, really. I don't think any of us fully do. Jesus doesn't call him out. He just hangs in there with him. He says, when Jesus heard this, look at verse 22, he said to him, one thing you still lack. I'm not, this is a shocking conversation. Sell all that you have, what? And distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. As a disciple, you join my band of disciples, come. Mark, Mark writes this. He says, looking at him, he loved him. I love that. You see, I mean, this sounds so stark. It sounds so harsh. But Mark says, no, 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 catch this. He loved him because all of the commands that God gives to us, even this one, is out of a heart of love. Now Jesus is looking not at this man's face. He's looking at his soul. And he says, I'm going to go after the one thing that's keeping you from real life. And we're troubled by that. And, and who wouldn't be? But we're troubled because we're looking at what he'll give up. And if you're thinking, you're tracking with me here, letting the spirit speak into your life. Lord, what are you calling me to give up? What are you calling me? Maybe, maybe you have fully released. You're not bound by, by the stuff of this world, by money. But I'm guessing uh, it's, it's more twisted than you might imagine. So what is the Lord saying to us? Because we're focused on what he's giving up, not on what he's going to gain. That's what Jesus is focused on. This guy, you could say, he has experienced some happiness in his life. Momentary, a bit of happiness here and there, fluctuating happiness. Jesus says, I want you, here's what you need. I want you to experience joy. Like joy in the Lord that's not based on your circumstance. So you stop living like this based on the approval of others, your performance, how much money you have, how much money you don't have. Oh, I'm, I'm like today. I'm not like so much. I, have a, I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in trouble. I don't have good health today. See, that is life for most of us. Jesus says, I want you to experience joy through it all. Isn't that what you want today? That's what we all really, really want. But then look at what happens here. Verse 23, but when he heard these things, he became very sad. I mean, despondent. This is the word that's used, very sorrowful. This is the word that's, that's used of Jesus in the garden the night before he's crucified. He is troubled, deeply troubled. This guy's grieving. He's very sad for he was extremely rich. Notice he doesn't walk away confused. He doesn't walk away angry. He walks away sad. Why is that? Because he experienced the real Jesus. And he's like, uh, you're being really clear here. I can't do that. He's sad because he's walking away saying, I will, I'm not going to do that. So I, I'd explain it this way. I have a good friend who um, just last week, he's skiing with his, friend, with, his, with his son up in Colorado. They're skiing, just doing a little easy run. But at one point, uh, in a bunch of uh, pow, 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 um, he, he's skiing, and, and his, his ski goes this way. His ankle, his foot goes that way, and his body goes this way. And, um, and then the excruciating pain was also a sign. But he broke his ankle in several, several places, something I've done as well, I'm not skiing. But it's another story. Um, so I'm, I'm empathizing with this friend of mine. Uh, he, he has a problem, right? And he knows this. this guy's smart. He contacts a doctor like immediately. Hey, what's going on here? What's happening? He gets checked out. Yeah, you're going to need surgery. We can fix the problem. I got the solution for you. And it's going to be rough because it's, it's painful rehab, all the things. But that's how you're going to fix this. Now, how crazy would it be? 
For my friend to say, I need some help. I, got my, I am hurting my ankle. My, my foot's flopping around. Like, I don't think this is right. I need to get this fixed. So go to a doctor, and the doctor says, yeah, we can fix that. Surgery. How crazy would it be if he goes, that's the solution? Yeah, that's it. It's going to be a little painful, but that's it. Uh, no, nah, I'm good. I'll just go through the rest of my life. I'm good. I'll be all right. How nuts is that? You wouldn't do that. Nobody would do that. You see, the rich young ruler, watch this. He has a problem and he knows it. I'm missing something. Jesus gives him the solution and he chooses not to receive the solution, the surgery. He doesn't give up. He doesn't surrender himself to the good doctor to fix his problem. So don't miss this. Why is he sad? He's walking away because he knows he still has a problem. There's still this pain, this ache in his soul. So why is this? Let's talk about it. What leads to false joy? It is the pursuit of what we think will bring us joy. The quick answer is, it's the pursuit of happiness. Temporary happiness along the way and not real joy that supersedes everything else, whatever comes in life. Because you know this, life is not up and to the right. It is challenging and hard. And we have dark nights of the soul. That's when we need joy. That's when we need something that our circumstances do not offer to us. That's when we need Jesus. Look at verse 24. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, so Jesus empathizing with him, he says to this to everybody, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God? Why is it so difficult? That's what we're getting underneath. Again, Jesus' heart goes out to him. Then he offers this famous statement. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And again, gang, I know wealth is relative. We're all rich. This is challenging. Commentators have said a lot about this. They've offered the analogy that, well, there was this gate that was called the eye of the needle because the camel couldn't quite go through. And I did a deep dive. I don't think there's substantial um, evidence for that. And I think what he says after this actually confirms kind of my thought around here. Think about this. The camel's the largest animal in Palestine by a long shot. I mean, Stacey and I have ridden camels in, in, in Palestine. I've ridden camels in the Middle East. I just go over there and ride camels. I mean, that's what I do. Um, but camels are giant. You might know that. Camels are huge. And then think about the eye of a needle. It's the smallest hole you can imagine. What is Jesus saying here? Look at what he says. Those who heard it were like, how, how can this, who can be saved? If not this guy who's doing it all. Who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. This is, that's the point of the camel through the eye of the needle. Not improbable, not unlikely, not will work really hard, get his nose through there first. Impossible. That's what Jesus is saying. Every kid in the house would know that. He's saying salvation from start to finish is not a human achievement. It is God alone, which is why it demands surrender, right? Jesus said it this way, Matthew 6, 21, for wherever your, what? Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. You understand what he's saying? We all treasure. Whatever you treasure the most in your life, whatever you're running after, you might say, well, how, do I, how would I know? What do you think about? How do you spend your time? What do you wrestle with? What are you anxious about? What makes you nervous? What makes you angry? You might lose it. See, it takes a deeper dive to get underneath that. We talk about this often because we are attached to idols. John Calvin said the heart is, a, is an idol-making factory. There are more idols than there are realities because we run after even imaginary things like false gods that do not provide for us. So wherever you tre whatever you treasure the most is where your passion, your energy, your life will be, and it will shape your entire life. Whatever your functional God is will drive your affections and your attention. It'll guide your calendar. It'll guide everything you think about. So how would you know what it is? Well, uh, it's that. It's, it's what you spend all your time on. 
This man's wealth was his substitute God. What is yours? What is it for you? What, what, what is it that's keeping you from life? C.S. Lewis again said, prosperity knits a man to this world. He feels like he's finding himself in it while really it's finding its place in him. It starts to drive us. It starts to lead us in everything we do, you see. And only Christ, think about it, every other idol that you're chasing, there are no other gods. They're all false they're not real. They're illusions. And we think that's going to provide what I'm looking for. And it never will. Again, maybe temporary happiness, which keeps us from true joy. So if not this guy, then who in the world? What we're wrestling with here is this. Jesus is asking more from us than we can ever imagine in order to give us more than we could ever fathom. Do you trust him? That's what it comes down to. Will we trust him? This guy, like many, made the mistake that I can add whatever it is to. And some of us think that. I'll just add Jesus to all the other things I'm doing. Like it's, like it's an addition problem. What do I lack? What do I need to do along with all these other things I'm doing? And Jesus says, no, you have to surrender your life. Lay down your idols. So let's land with this. How do we find true joy? How do we inherit? How do you receive true joy? Because this is what you're after, friends, today. Whether you came in here realizing it or not, we must smash our substitute idols by realizing that in Jesus we have found the greater affection. We have found the great joy of releasing our lives to him. And some of us, all of us in varying degrees perhaps as Christians, we've experienced this. Look at what Peter says in verse 28. Peter said, see, we, we left our homes and, and followed you. You hear what he's doing? Like he's so blown away. He's going, uh, are we okay? Are we good? Like we, we kind of left some stuff, didn't we? We left and we're following you. Are we, are we in? Like if he's not, because he's better than any of us. And he's, he's like, he needs some assurance, doesn't he? And then, then Jesus says, says to him, uh, truly I say to you, he's, he's affirming him. He's saying, hey, there's no one who's left house or wife or brothers or parents or children. Those who've left all the, and these guys have left family and plans and all the things the disciples had. So he's saying, hey, anybody who does this for the sake of the kingdom who will not uh, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Ever last. Yes, Peter, yes, you, you've done well. You've given up a lot. And no one who gives up all things uh, to follow me, that you will be rewarded in this life and the next, he says. So Matthew summarizes this encounter with Jesus saying this, in the kingdom of God, many who are First in this world will be last. See, those who are last, the lepers, the kids, tax collectors, they're going to be first in the kingdom. It's a flipped, right? It's a flipped kingdom. So Jesus could have, here's what he could have done. He could have said to this guy early on, all these commandments, let's go to the first one. I've kept all these commands. Let's go to the first one that is the umbrella that guides all the others. You know what the first one is? No other gods before me. Let's go to that one. He didn't do it. But that's the one that drives all the others. And the man did not put God first in his life. And Jesus is offering us the solution no other gods before you. Now, I've talked about this before, and I think it's, it's worth delving into a little bit. There's a fascinating reality that comes to play here, and it's called the paradox of hedonism. You may have heard about this. It's a philosophical thing. It's not a Christian thing. And the paradox of hedonism in philosophy says you'll never experience happiness by pursuing happiness. You only achieve happiness by pursuing something else. That's interesting. In other words, it ensues is the word. It follows. It's the result of not pursuing happiness, but pursuing something else, and it comes along. Now, that's legit. 
But again, Jesus is not after happiness. He's after joy. So we know this. You will never experience joy, true joy. It's not based on circumstance until you follow after someone else. Till you pursue Jesus with all you've got, then you experience the joy that is found in him. It's found in pursuing him. So what is it for you? Friends, before we go, we're going to spend some time. We're going we're to watch a, a story. We've talked about encountering Jesus. We're going to watch one of our own who's encountered Jesus, a kind of a rich young ruler story of sorts. And then we're going to sing a song before we go. And my hope for you is not that you'll leave sad, but that you'll leave surrendered, knowing that with surrender comes the real joy. So let's get back to his first question. What must I do to experience real life, Zoe, everlasting life in the here and now? See, money is so twisted up in that because we think if someone has done well, then things will go good for them. If you're good, you'll do well as if it's really based on what we do. And we st can start to believe that in other areas of our lives, even in our Christian life. If I do well, all things will go well with me until they don't. That's where the pursuit of Jesus has got to dominate everything else. See, the bottom line answer to this question is you can't do anything to gain eternal life because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, right? Right? Every one of us. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ, this story, it's, this is a mind-blowing story. Because Jesus wants you to experience joy because he's the one. When he becomes the highest prize, here it is, listen. When he becomes the treasure, your highest pursuit, money is no longer sacred or anything else. Because he is so much better than anything this world could provide. And then finally, listen, you're released. Finally, you're released from the chains, from discontent, from needing more, because more will never be enough. You're finally set free, but only when you surrender to Jesus. So that's our great hope for you today. And you can do so because he is the greatest treasure. He's the prize. He's the one because he gave up all of his riches and glory to become poor, to become like us. All the way to the cross, Paul describes this in Philippians 2. He dies a criminal death, a poor man's death for us so that we would receive the riches of glory in him. Praise be to God. Amen. For a savior who sets us free. So I want you to watch this video and um, consider your life. And then we're going to have a moment to just surrender to him through song. In fact, before we watch Evan, let's just bow our heads for a moment. What is it for you? The Spirit of God has been speaking to you. And I'm guessing you're like me, you're thinking, I want Jesus to be my highest priority, my ultimate prize. I want to seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and everything else will fall into place. Well, you've done well to be here today. You can, again, surrender to him. Name what it is before him. Maybe share it with someone else today what is the idol you tend to run to and don't miss this often it's good things that have become God things in our lives and they take us down so Lord we give you our lives and we thank you that you keep on changing lives from those who are unbelievers to believers atheists to disciples and all of us in between, we give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.